players home. He didn't have a ride. Um, and the coach usually takes him home. And um, I don't know why I'm sharing this, but um, it's a good kid. Uh, I was able to encourage him, and it was just, when you see where people live and you get to see where they're from. I had to drive all the way out to Montrose. It's the first time I've ever actually stopped in Montrose. Um, I've driven through it once, coming on the, on the way back, almost hit deer. It was a night. Um, but when you, um, I, 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 this kid's a junior, and I, I, I remember freshman year was awful at football, terrible. He's now one of our starting offensive linemen. Um, when you get to see people, it changes your sp- perspective how you see them, how I'm going to now see this, this boy from here on out, um, and moved me deeply that night. So I um, just want to share that because we're talking about something that just Sam just sang about, but something that for some reason in the church bothers people. When we talk about numbers, um, but the thing is, what we have to realize is numbers matter because people matter. We're going to be in numbers 1 through 10. We're, get, we're in a big area. I'm not going to read 1 through 10, but we're going to take little passages and see how numbers need to matter to us there's a, there's, and just see just how God shows that to us, even in the Old Testament. But to give you a background on the book of Numbers, The book of Numbers takes place one year after the Israelites have left Egypt, okay? And it directly, Megan, if you can, just turn me a little bit down. Um, It takes place directly one year after Israel leaves Egypt and directly follows the happenings in the book of Leviticus. And here's the thing. Numbers is not a great title to describe what's going on in it because it's a boring title. Because immediately what makes me think of is math. Calculus, algebra, if you're really like math, trig. But the thing is, if you you go look back in the Torah and the, the original writings, the original Hebrew title for this means in the wilderness. And accurately describes what is actually going on here because the book of Numbers doesn't actually have that many numbers in it. Yes, it starts off with the census, but the rest of it is about the Israelites in the wilderness and their rebellion. So the book only starts off with the census, but the rest of the book is about Israel's rebellion. And so Leviticus covers one year, whereas the book of Numbers covers 40 years of Israel traveling through the wilderness again. Leviticus was all about God training his people how to be his people because they leave Egypt. None of them have known anything outside of Egypt. We have to remember that. They've been there for 400 years. None of them know anything besides Egyptian religion. So God takes them to Mount Sinai after they cross the Red Sea and God basically takes them through a spiritual boot camp. And this is another thing just to take out there Well, we have to realize there are people that we meet and people who come to Christianity and they get saved. And we expect them to know everything that they should know or how they shouldn't act, but we we don't realize their background. And realizing, you know what, it may take this person a little while to realize that whatever they were involved in, it may take them a little while to get that out of their life because that's what their life was. I don't care what it is. Alcohol, drugs, language. Whatever it might be, we have to realize there are people in this world that have not grown up in the church. They haven't grown up in a Christian family. And we have to realize people are lost. So God does this with his people where he takes them to Mount Sinai, takes them through his spiritual boot camp in Leviticus, and then sends them ultimately to the promised land in the book of Numbers to a place that God has prepared specifically for them. And he's shown them how to live in that land. But what is God's ultimate purpose is not just for them to live in this land that they're headed to, but to be an example and light to other nations. Now it's time for them to leave 
and claim what he has promised. But before we get into that, I want to tell you a story that's going to kind of set up what we're talking about tonight. I want to introduce you to Desmond Doss. Served in World War II. You may have heard about him. He enlisted in the army in World War II. He was not drafted. But the thing is, what most people know about Desmond Doss is he refused to carry a weapon. Now, if you read some of his story, there's a reason for that. Most of it is because of his religious be- beliefs. He was a Seventh-day Adventist. I found out recently when I was studying about Desmond Doss, um, he was from Lynchburg, Virginia. I went to school in Lynchburg, Virginia, and never heard about him. And so when I got to hear about him and ultimately saw the movie about him, I was like, man, what a great story to hear about him. I didn't even know about him. So Desmond Doss enlisted in the army, refused to hold a weapon, did not engage in active fighting due to his religious beliefs and other reasons. He was a combat medic, and his unit served at the Battle of Okinawa. And here on the right, this is a picture of him actually standing up at the the top, but his unit had to scale a 400-foot cliff to get to the fighting that they were going to be a part of. And after a fierce fight with the Japanese... His unit was ordered to retreat back down the cliff. Mind you, while under fire. Now Doss, however, chose to remain and return to the battlefield, not once, not twice, but again and again to find wounded soldiers and bring them to safety. He personally, by himself, lowered men from the top of the ridge down to the people waiting at the bottom by himself, And after letting each man down, and I'm going to show you this video to to dramatize, to show you what kind of was going on, he would actually be praying to God, Lord, help me get one more. Help me get one more. So, Megan, before you show the video, I need to give a disclaimer for anybody who has a younger child in here. There's nothing of fighting, but there is a brief um, 30 seconds in, half a second, of a wounded soldier that may not may not be suitable, that's up to you, but I just want to give that disclaimer 30 seconds in. Um, but I want you to see just kind of how they dramatize and what was going on with Desmond at this moment and just getting to experience this whole thing of him just praying to God and him continually going after get pe- going to get people. Go ahead, Megan. This illustrates and gives you the idea of what may have been going on. Desmond saved the lives 
of 75. Not only U.S. soldiers, but Japanese soldiers as well. He was the first non-combatant in U.S. military history to receive the Medal of Honor for his actions, and, even though this is not really his, this shouldn't be his title, the only conscientious objector to ever receive the Medal of Honor. Numbers matter because people matter. For every number Desmond saved, there was a name for each one. We have to realize that in the spiritual battle that we're fighting every day, that's the same thing. So numbers 1 through 10. And let me give you just an understanding and give you another picture of where we're at. Because we have to understand who the people of God are, who the Israelites are. We have to realize that God started everything off in Genesis. God made everything in his design, even us, humanity, and he started with Adam. And after Adam sinned, God basically, in a way, reset, st- reset and started with the man named Abraham. And God made a promise to him that he would be a father to many nations. And even though he was old and didn't have children yet, he ended up having descendants that would have a place and a land to call their home. Years later... After God had made that promise, they end up in Egypt and unfortunately become slaves for hundreds of years, but God sets them free in the book of Exodus and brought them to Mount Sinai in Leviticus. So let's look at Numbers 1, 1 through 5. So this is the context. They've they've now left, okay? And so God basically tells them, take a census, tells Moses to take a census. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting in the wilderness of Sinai on the first day day of the second month of the second year after Israel's departure from the land of Egypt. Take a census of the entire Israelite community by their clans and their father's families, counting the names of every male one by one. You and Aaron are to register those who are 20 years or older, older or more, by their military divisions, everyone who can serve in Israel's army. A man from each tribe is to be with you, each one on the head of his ancestral family. These are the names of the men who are to assist you, and we're not going to look at those names. But you get the idea here. Now, there are other times in the Bible where there are senses taken. Actually, David takes one, um, but it's actually it's sinful because God did not tell him to take a census. God here is specifically telling Moses to say, take a census, and there's a reason. So they, God is counting all the people. He's counting all the males of 20 years or older who can fight in the army. Why the men? Well, the most important we, the thing we have to remember, and God does this throughout Scripture, God calls out the men because of their responsibility. They are to be the leaders. They are to be the example. God has placed them in a headship role of their families. They, everything falls on top of their leadership. They are the ones, they are responsible, that God holds accountable. They are the ones that are to maintain the peace. They're not to be the problem causing division, but to be the solution. They're the ones to make a difference. The same things today. We have to make a difference, especially men in the community and the church. Not through their own power, but through the power of Jesus to change the world. So the dudes are the only ones counted, not because everyone else doesn't matter, but because God sees them as the strength of the nation. So let's take a minute and think back to Abraham. God had told him what would happen, and Abram didn't believe that God would make him into a great nation. God called Abraham at the age of 70 and made him a promise at 75, and then he had a child at the age of 100. He had to wait 30 years. But God is ultimately showing right here at the beginning of Numbers that one, God loves, I don't have this up there, that's my fault, Megan. God loves to promise the impossible. God loves to promise the impossible, and you're about to see that. They count these people, and it's crazy, from one man, how many people come from him. God promised Abraham, who had no children, who couldn't have children, that he would have children, and that his children would change the world. Abraham thought it was too late, but not in God's time. 25 years later, he has a son. Generations later, here in the book of Numbers, this is what we come to where we're about to read, how God's promise has been fulfilled, that the impossible has happened. A nation of people. So let's see how many they counted in Numbers 1, 44 through 46. So they got, God tells them to take the census. They say, hey, here are all the men. 
that are the leaders, and here's the men that fall under them. These are the men Moses and Aaron registered with the assistance of the 12 leaders of Israel. Each represented his ancestral family. So all the Israelites, 20 years old or more, everyone who could serve in Israel's army were registered by their ancestral families. All those registered numbered 603,550. This comes from a man at 100 years old had a child who didn't think he'd ever have a child. 603,550 people of men, sorry, men, came from one man who thought it was impossible, but God promised the impossible. God promised that he would bring a great nation to one man. So what we have to realize, God is showing the Israelites here that he always keeps his promises. God's trying to help them remember, hey, look at how many people you are now. Look at where you came from. Think all the way back to Abraham. The impossible happened, and God promised it. And where is he taking them now? Hey, remember that, that you've heard about how I promised Abraham this land. Guess where you're getting ready to go? God wants to make a difference in your life. God wants to make a difference in my life, to impact others, even when it seems impossible. God is revealing his faithfulness by having them count. God is saying, look at how I brought you out. And look what I'm bringing you to. You came from a man that had no children, and there are now 600,000 men. These numbers don't include women. These numbers don't include children. These numbers don't include teenagers or the elderly. These are fighting men. So historians believe, rough numbers, that there were over 2 million in total. 2 million in total came from one man. That's a lot of people. Think about our own community. According to recent statistics, the city of Dublin has 16,000. Multiply that by 37, you get 600,000. Lawrence County has 48,000. Multiply that by 12 and you get 600,000. Then multiply it by 41 and you have 2 million people. Atlanta has 472,500 people. There's a lot of people coming from one man. Israel is literally, literally seeing the promises of God fulfilled. And so what does God love to do? God loves big numbers and God loves growth. What God loves, that's what he does. God loves growth spiritually, becoming more and more like Jesus, and numerical growth, numbers, adding people. So God loves to count people Because people count. Each person counts. Each person has value. Each person has worth. Why? Because they are created in the image of God. I don't care your background. I don't care your race or your creed. Every person counts. Numbers in the Bible show God's power. Why do you think the days of creation are recorded? One, two, three, four, five, six. Why is the census even recorded for us? They are there, not just so that we can be like, man, there's a whole bunch of numbers and a whole bunch of names. They're there for us to read and think about them. How God can do anything. And if God can do anything then, he sure can do it now. How he is good. How he can be trusted. People who've been enslaved for 400 years, a man that came from nothing, that didn't even have a child. How he can be trusted. How God is good how he can do anything. And the question is, do we really believe that? Because if God can do that, why can't we trust him? Why would we not trust God? New Testament passages that back up that God loves to count people and that numbers matter. Acts 2.41 says this, So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. That's after Peter's first sermon. You have in Acts 4, 4, the number grows to be 5,000. Acts 5, 14, believers were added in increasing numbers and multitudes. Acts 6, 1, they, it says that the disciples were increasing in number. Acts 6, 7, it says again, the disciples increased. Well, what about the end of the, end of the world? Revelation 7, 9 through 10. Do I have that for you? Good, okay. 
Revelation 7, 9 through 10 says, After this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. It says there are multitudes, people from every background, from different languages. What does this passage show us about people? God is not a racist. God is not prejudiced. God created all people because all, peop- because all people are around the throne. All types of people from all over the world, not in separate churches, but joined together. That's what heaven looks like. Jesus sitting on a throne and people everywhere surrounding that throne. There, it's, it basically is given this idea there are so many people that you won't be able to count them all. You have to wonder why some of these other religions say, you know, only a certain amount of people are getting into heaven. Well, Revelation doesn't say that. It says you can't count them. There's multitudes. But the thing is, this multitudes doesn't mean everybody who is created is going to be there. It's only people who have called on the name of Jesus and are truly saved. So what is God trying to show us here? That God wants you, he wants me, he wants us corporately to spread the message, spread his message. So the point of our church, the point of any church in Christianity is to share with others and bring them back in, bring them into the fold. And this is all building on what we're trying to get to here. Not to sit and just be, have fun and be comfortable in a worship service. The point is to prepare us with the gospel, to share, to bring people back in. The point is to share the message of Jesus. We gather together, but then what are we to do? Scatter and tell people about Jesus. You have to wonder why in Acts, what happened when, when after the Spirit comes, persecution starts, what does that cause the church to do? Scatter. And I truly believe if God would have not allowed the persecution, they would have stayed in Jerusalem and would have been happy there. But God was trying to show, hey, I've given you the Spirit. What are you supposed to do with it? Scatter everywhere. There's a reason why the Jews and Saul, who's eventually turned into Paul, were scared because they were scattering everywhere. It's like an anthill getting smashed and just everybody goes everywhere. So the point is to share the message of Jesus. Not just gather, be comfortable. But the thing is, what we have to remember is sharing the message of Jesus is not something we do by ourselves. God does it through us. He gives us the strength and the power to share. And so the thing is, what we have to decide to do is be a part of the movement that will change the world. That has changed the world. That is changing the world. And it's the one that follows Jesus and takes him wherever you go. The thing is, though, God is not just about crowds. God is about specific people. I remember serving up at the church where I interned at. I remember we were counting numbers, which were great. But the thing is, is I remember on Wednesday nights, Wednesday nights counting heads, and I just told them, I was like, I, the numbers are great, the crowds are great, but I really want to put a name with a face. Because I was concerned about that. There were a whole bunch of students coming in that I was like, never seen them. I've seen their face. I don't have a name. But the thing is, God is about crowds, but he's not just about big crowds. He's about specific people. God is all about numbers, and we should too. Big churches are not better than small churches. Small churches are not better than big churches, but God is all about growth. This is the problem. The problem is when churches don't want to grow. And I'm going to say this and just throw it out there. You can have a different opinion, but I don't see this in Scripture as far as having this attitude. If you don't want a church to grow, that's sinful. God's always trying to add people into the flock. Spiritual and numerical growth are both important in understanding that the best is always yet to come. In a church, we should always believe that the best is yet to come, never being satisfied with what we have or where we've been. I want to share this quote with you. It's from a church in South Carolina that says this, and I would this is a great thing to memorize, but to know. It says this, every number, I don't know why I put numbers, every number has a name, every name has a story, and every story matters to God. 
That's how we need to view people. That's what happened to me this past Friday. I just, just getting the, I knew this kid, I, well, I actually didn't know the kid's name. I knew his nickname. And when I was driving him home, got to learn his r- actual name. But just understanding his story, understanding his background, every number has a name. Every name has a story. And every story matters to God. The thing is, the problem is numbers bother people because we have put the wrong value on numbers. But the thing is, if you say, Stephen, why are you talking about numbers? Numbers don't really matter. Well, if you tell me that, then if you say numbers don't matter, then you're saying that my one, who I know that I could tell you by name tonight, you're telling me that one doesn't matter. If numbers don't matter, that means that people who who are not saved currently don't matter. That if you say numbers don't matter, that means that the person you go to church with who's not saved doesn't matter. The person you work with that doesn't matter. The person that you're going to walk by doesn't matter. That's why we have to view these numbers as a name and that they have a story. Numbers don't give us value, but they matter. That's the problem is what happens is we only focus what happens, why people are scared of numbers is because we make numbers as what, what's the value, but the number isn't the value isn't just in the number, it's in the, in the person and that the person matters to God and that they're created in the image of God and understanding their story. So we want to reach as many people as we can so we can disciple them and we can send them back out. We need to reach as many as we can and teach them. We need to see people saved. We need to reach people that aren't in church, not just taking from other churches, not just someone who's already involved in church. We need to get people that are far from God. We need to be passionate about life change. We should never be comfortable. And I just want you to dream. How awesome would it be be if this room on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, was so full that we had to have a simulcast, that we had to have another service. That's what our dream should be. It should be something that challenges us. It should be something that in our power is not possible, but only through God that it's possible. So, the way to grow numerically is by focusing on people individually. This means focus on relationship. Focus on being intentional. Moses had about 2 million people he was leading. But I want you to check this out. You would think if he had 2 million people that he was satisfied. That he didn't have to worry about one more person. He's doing great. 2 million people. I've got 600,000 fighting men. There's nobody else we need to have. We've got our own people. We don't need anybody else. We don't need to bring anybody in, but not so fast. Numbers 10, 29 through 32. You may have never read this before. Moses said to Hobab, descendant of Reuel, the Midianite, and Moses' relative by marriage. Reuel the Midianite. We're setting out for the place the Lord promised. I will give it to you. Come with us and he will treat you well, for the Lord has promised good things to Israel. But he replied to him, I don't want to go. Instead, I'll go to my own land And my relatives, please don't leave us, Moses said. Since you know where we should camp in the wilderness and you can serve as our eyes, if you come with us, whatever good the Lord does for us, we will do for you. This is his family. Son of Reuel is another name for Jethro, his father-in-law. Somebody who knows the land they're about to walk into. Someone who had, didn't leave with them from Egypt. But he's like, you know what? I've got two million people, but I'm, I'm concerned about one person who I want to experience the blessings of God, to experience what God is already doing in this community. Moses is basically saying this, that if you want to experience God, and this is what God wants us to know, if you want to experience God and Jesus... Next for me. If you want to experience God and Jesus, you must be a part of the people of God. Moses knows this. He knows this for his family member, that he's so desperately pleading. He's saying, come and travel with us. 
God is going to do amazing things, and the kingdom of God will be set up in the promised land. Not that the promised land represents heaven. It's the spirit-filled life. But he's saying, hey, what you have right now cannot compare to what God's about to do with us. What God's about to do for his people, you can be a part of this. You can be a part of us being a light to the nations. He wanted Hobab to be a part of it. He had almost two million people to worry about, and he went after one person. God is not just about a whole bunch of people. He's about one. But Hobab, what did he want to do? He wanted to go home. He wanted to go back to what's comfortable and familiar. And this is the thing with people when they're caught up in sin, but they're in a life that they're not following Jesus, they want to go back to what's comfortable, what they know. That's why, similar to Moses, you have to be persistent with people. You have to be intentional. Intentional. Moses could have said, you know what? Since you don't want to come, go on. Go, get out of here. Leave us. Since you don't want to be a part of us, we don't need you. We don't want you. No, he didn't say that. He wanted two million and one. He begged and pleaded one person to go with him because the one mattered to Moses. One mattered to Moses. You can imagine the feeling. Not only it's because it's somebody he cares about, but it's somebody in his own family. That he wants, to experience, wants him to experience what God is doing. Just imagine the passion. Imagine the tears that are probably coming down his face. Imagine his voice shaking. God loves big crowds. God loves big worship. God loves growth spiritually and numerically. But God doesn't just see a sea of people. He sees each person individually. We know from Scripture that God knows your name. That God knows the hairs on your head. He knows exactly where you are. If God cares about that, we need to care about one. That we don't ever need to be okay with someone missing out on God and what he has. And what we have to get our minds around and what we have to think is that we are never supposed to be okay. Never think there are enough people here and be satisfied and be comfortable. God sees those who are not a part of his family and all those who haven't given their life, lives to Jesus and it breaks his heart. And he sends us on a mission. Sends us on a mission that everyone can. So as Pastor, as Brad's already talked about before, who's your one? Who's one person? I have one. Someone who I'm desperately waiting to come to Jesus. If you don't have one, find one. If you don't have one, pray for one. If you don't have one and you're okay with not having one, What are we supposed to be doing? We've got to be passionate about people responding to the Word of God, to experiencing salvation, and hearing the gospel. And the thing is, people will hear about salvation and the gospel here. If you're too scared, if you're too nervous, just bring them to church. And you know what? If they don't respond to the gospel, you at least have a message to take home and talk with them about later. Like, hey, you know, what do you think about what the pastor talked about today? Fill out the notes. Hey, what did you think about this right here? Maybe there was something that impacted you that wasn't on the notes. Hey, what do you think about this quote? If they don't respond, don't give up on them. But if you have invited them and they haven't come yet, Don't give up on them. Like Moses, we must beg those close to us 
and do whatever it takes. So how do we invite people to church? What's the application here? Well, like Moses, be excited. Be excited about what people can be a part of. Be excited about how God changed your life. Have passion. Have emotion. We have to stop being cold and dead because who wants any part of that? Because if you're cold and dead, they're not going to want any part of Jesus. The thing is, we want to be have passion, have emotion, be excited for someone to be a part of us, to come and experience what God's doing, what God's done in your life. Be excited too. Be persistent. Don't give up. Now, I'm not saying harass them. No. <laughs> Don't harass them. But what we have to realize, just like you and me, people get busy. When people get busy, what happens? They get forgetful. But send a reminder. Be intentional. Be persistent. Three, be smart. Use your influence. With those around you, don't underestimate the impact you have on others. You may not realize it, but there are plenty of people that have your imp- have an imp- you have an impact on. Invite them. And then four, pray for the one like Moses begged his, his family member. Maybe you need someone to pray for you to be passionate. Maybe you need somebody else to come alongside you and and you tell them, hey, this is my one. I need help praying for him. We need to to tag team this person, just be praying over and over for him. Maybe you have to pray to be concerned about other people, to see people through God's eyes, to realize that they are lost. The thing is, we all know people, we have to reach them, we have to invite them, we have to talk more about Jesus than ourselves. I showed the students this past Wednesday how you can relate pizza to the gospel. Learn how you can just throw Jesus in there. Learn how, just just be thinking about things of conversations. I don't know if you're going to be talking about football tomorrow and Georgia Notre Dame game last night. Like, you know, how I survived the, the fall of all the Notre Dame players. Are you su- surviving the fall of me? I don't know. Who knows? I just know that happened in the game, and I watched it. So, But there's creative ways to be smart, to share with people, to not make it too awkward. Talk about Jesus more than ourselves. Beg God to use you to reach people for Jesus. Let God use you as one of them. I heard a preacher say this once, that he had, got a, he had read a pastor say this, that if nothing else is working, prayer's not working, everything you're doing, you're inviting somebody, he said this, try tears. If there's somebody that means that much to you, when's the last time you, you wept over somebody? wept over knowing what would happen to that person if they died this instant. Because hell is real. So I'll finish with this story. Rick Warren, who's a pastor of a large church in California, an author of Purpose Driven Life and Purpose Driven Church, His father was a minister for over 50 years, serving in a lot of small rural churches. He was a simple preacher, but had a great mission. His dad built and planted over 150 churches around the world over his lifetime, and in 1999, his father died of cancer. In the final week, Rick's father was in a semi-conscious state. One night near the end of his father's life, Rick's father tried to get out of bed, but he was too weak. He persisted, and Rick asked him, what are you trying to do? His dad replied, got to save one more for Jesus. Got to save one more for Jesus. Got to save one more for Jesus. 
he rep- repeated that phrase over and over for the next hour. And it, Rick said that he probably repeated it over 100 times. Rick sat by the bed with tears flowing down his cheeks. Then his dad reached out and placed his hand on Rick's head and said, Save one more for Jesus. Save one more for Jesus. Always be on the lookout to reach one more for Jesus. Ultimately, that's one of the things that pushed Rick to write about this purpose-driven church, about the purpose-driven life. Focus on reaching one more for Jesus. Because even one makes a greater difference for eternity. If you want to be used by God, you must care about what God cares about. People coming to Him through salvation. Nothing matters more to God. Nothing else that we can come up with matters more to God than one person who's saved. It says that heaven rejoices over one. So maybe you have a one. I don't care if I'm in a church. Maybe that one's you. Maybe you have to respond to the gospel. Maybe you've come to church and played church your whole life. You came on Sundays. You came on Wednesdays. But you've never had a changed life. Not realizing that God made us in a design made perfectly in His image. But man sinned and broke that relationship with him and that all the different things that we try to do and try to get out of it will never suffice it will never mean anything it will never be able to get us back in relationship with jesus it will never fix us but god who is great in mercy sent his son jesus to this earth as 100% God, as 100% man, to live the life that each one of us are expected to live, which is perfection, that we can't. But sent Jesus, who lived this life perfectly, went to a cross that was for us willingly, gave his life and suffered the full wrath, full brunt of God's judgment on himself in our place. And died. But three days later, he resurrected, which showed that he not only had victory over death, but he had victory over sin. And if we believe in him, and if we turn from the life that we're living and surrender our life to him, and that we follow him the rest of our life, that his life can become ours. And that we can have a new relationship with Christ. That's what we're supposed to be passionate about. Numbers matter. People matter because of that. Because Jesus gave his life for you. Let's pray. God, sometimes we can get off track. God, we can forget how people all around us matter. 